Um, we're really pleased today to have Theodore Gray from my alma mater, University of Illinois, here today. Uh, Teo is the author of The Elements, A Visual Explanation, which some of you probably have. It has about one million copies in print, and he also is the co-founder of Wolfram, Wolfram Research, 1987, and are you working on Wolfram Alpha now? Or? Yeah, not anymore. Not anymore. Um, so today he's got an um, exciting new book I can't wait to read, called Molecules, the Elements, and the Architecture of Everything. So please welcome Theodore Gray. Hello. Um, so I put up the cat slide. I added this um, after my first talk on this book tour because right before, the very first talk that I gave on this book tour, this kid came up with his phone and, and was very excited to show me a picture of this cat because this is the cat that he's named after me because he's such a big fan. And it's like, well, I guess it's downhill from here because... Um, <laughs> Anyway, so, so actually, how many of you have my Elements book or have seen it? So that's quite a few. Um, maybe just a very quick recap of uh, sort of how I ended up in this line of work. Um, there's this book, Uncle Tungsten. So if, you've, if you like my book, you'll definitely like this one. It's a great book by Oliver Sacks. Um, and he talks about this uh, periodic table that he used to visit in the Science Museum in London when he was a kid. And when I was reading this, I thought he meant like a table that was in the shape of the periodic table. And I thought that was just the coolest idea ever. Um, and then you know, I kind of read along a little further and discovered that actually, no, uh, it's, it's just a wall display, same as everybody else's. And it was kind of confusingly worded. But that sort of gave me the idea that you know, there ought to be a periodic table. Um, so I ended up building this periodic table. And for various reasons that. Uh, you know, don't make a whole lot of sense. What? Somebody's calling. That's not going to work. Um, so uh, uh, because of some technicalities and how I built it, it ended up with each of the tiles, each of the little you know, element tiles that are engraved with the, the information being loose with a little compartment underneath. And because of that, I thought, you know, I could like, get some elements and put them into those compartments and you know, collect elements. And then I discovered eBay which was just kind of coming into its own around that time. This is like 2002 or so. Um, and it just kind of like the whole, the whole enterprise has been a series of slippery slopes and maybe a little bit poor decision making or something because you know, it just kind of got out of hand. And I've since <laughs> actually had to, I had to add two more display cases so far of, you know, to hold the various elements. Um, then Oliver Sacks you know, heard about this and the fact that it was his fault that I built this table. And so he came to visit it, and that was cool. Um, and then I got this thing called the Ig Nobel Prize, which is awarded for achievements that cannot or should not be replicated, um, which I think of as pretty much the only honor for which a periodic table table is actually eligible. Uh, and so I made a crappy website. And then I got a call from the, um, Popular Science, said, would you like to write a column? So I ended up spending literally 10 years writing a column for Popular Science. And I'll tell you in a little bit why I stopped doing that. Um, so that was like one page every month about some random topic in chemistry or science or something like that. Turned into two books. Um, Mad Science is the first five years. Mad Science 2 is the second five years. Um, I improved my website. I got periodictable.com, which is a beautiful URL. Um, uh, anyway, so I, 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 when I started collecting these elements, I realized like if I don't take a picture of each one and write a little description of it, I'm going to forget what they are. There's just no way that I'm going to remember you know, 50, let alone 500 or 3,000 currently different element samples. Um, so I started photographing them. And you know, I kind of got into that and started doing it a little better. And eventually I ended up with a set of photographs like this. And I thought, well, I should make a poster because periodic tables are kind of boring. And so I published this poster. Uh, right before Christmas, um, 2005 or six, something like that, um, and that did pretty well. People people liked it, um, and then at some point I kind of thought, well, I guess I have enough. I could probably write like a little bit about each element, and I've got you know several different samples about each element, so I should make a book because I'm not making any money on the website. I was making like. Three or four hundred dollars a month on Google Ads, which is very nice, thank you Google. But it's not really, you know, it's not that exciting in terms of putting more work into it. Uh, although I understand Simon has friends who make about 
you know, a good bit more than that on similar science sorts of themed websites. But nevertheless, I thought a book would be good because a book you can you can put it in paper and you can sell it. Um, and so this now is, has, a, as of this summer, about a million copies in print in 23 languages, which is very nice. Um, uh, what, what people who look at the print book don't realize is that at some point, rather than just taking a picture of each thing, I started putting each thing on a turntable and doing like a VR rotation of it, where we do a you know, photograph from every angle uh, all the way around, so that I could actually start you know, doing things like this. But the problem was that there wasn't really any platform on which it seemed realistic to use this imagery. Like you can't print it because it's paper, and you can't really sell it as you know, desktop computer software. It just didn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, but fortunately, Steve Jobs had this, you know, this you know, semi-annual descent from a higher plane to hand the world a thing that they didn't know what they wanted, you know, that they needed it, but couldn't live without. And right as, you know, just a few months after um, we came out with the print book, the iPad was announced. And I thought, wow, that is exactly what I need. Um, I could make an ebook in which all the objects, so in the actual ebook, you spin them with your finger. They're not just continuously animating like that. You just take each one and spin it. Um, and through various um, uh, reasons to do with Wolfram Research more so than science writing, we actually had a prototype iPad for the two month interval between the announcement and the ship date of the iPad, um, which was a deep, dark secret at the time. Um, but it was fun because we, we, meant we could actually do a pretty good job of developing this software. Uh, and releasing it as an iPad app simultaneously with the launch of the iPad. And that's done, that's done really well. Uh, uh, it, because you know, it's, it's very good for Apple, and they, you know, it's, like it's in their TV commercials. And, um, we're going to skip the Japanese Elements song, because uh, we're just going to. Uh, um, and because some of you may have heard it, and some of you may not. And either way, we don't need to play it again. Um, uh, so that led to me uh, starting a company called TouchPress, which is um, an app, an iPad app publishing company. Sorry, no Android at the moment. Um, and we published 20 or so apps. The reason I stopped doing my popular science column is because uh, we did this thing called Disney Animated, which was uh, iPad app of the year last year. And through a series of what I consider very poor decision-making process on the part of Disney, they decided that I should be the author of that of the ebook component of that app as well as the designer of the thing. Um, and I was like, when I was growing up, I wasn't allowed to watch Disney movies because my parents considered them kind of lowbrow. And so I really knew absolutely nothing about Disney. So I had to spend like a year indoctrinating myself with, with everything Disney. And it was kind of fun. You know, I got to talk to all these people and, and, and um, develop the, the zeal of the convert, you know, because I'm new to all this and it's all so amazing. Um, and so we, you know, we, we made this uh, app about it. And that, that ended in me um, basically blowing off popular science for so long that they eventually decided I'm not a reliable columnist anymore. Uh, and now I don't write that column anymore. But you know, as a trade off, we got iPad app of the year, which was cool. Um, and so, you know, so I spent several years being kind of distracted making essentially other people's apps. Um, and I decided a little over a year ago that I'm done with that. I'm going to go back and write. Uh, the second in the trilogy that I had intended to, to do from the very beginning with elements. <laughs> elements, molecules, reactions. There's a fourth in the trilogy, uh, which has become necessary because molecules doesn't cover uh, biological macromolecules. So it'll actually be a four part trilogy eventually. Um, uh, so yeah, so I started on molecules. And uh, that's what I'm here for now. And so now I'm going to just tell you kind of some random stories out of the molecules, things that I think are interesting. Um, we start with. Um, this slide, uh, which actually made more sense when I was giving this talk jointly with this is my girlfriend, Nina Paley, um, who has outstanding Van de Graaff hair. It's like it's the best I've ever seen. Um, and that's, so that's an illustration of static electricity, which is what holds molecules together, essentially. It's the electrostatic force that is keeping these things all knitted together. Uh, and it's also an illustration of uh, the fact that I do a lot of um, uh, things involving thread. We have these giant computerized embroidery machines and quilting machines. Um, and the first story is about thread. So this is cotton. Uh, this is what you pick if you're out picking cotton. And it's you know, those little fibers in there. All the fibers in a cotton plant are about an inch long. And each one has a tiny seed at the end. Uh, and this is a 6,000 yard cone of cotton thread. 
So 6,000 yards, that's about three and a half miles. This is, it's actually quite small. It's a standard sort of commercial size uh, cone of thread. And all the fibers in it are still only an inch long. They don't like glue them together or anything. The only thing holding it together is the twist. And if you untwist it very carefully, um, you can actually separate the thread and, and nothing breaks. It's like you don't break any uh, fibers when you take apart a cotton thread like that because they weren't fastened to each other in the first place. Uh, and this turns out to be an excellent analogy um, to the way certain polymers hold each other together. Uh, polyethylene, for example, this is a highly schematic drawing of polyethylene. And the connections down the carbon backbone of a polyethylene molecule like this are very, very strong. But the forces between the polyethylene molecules are quite weak. They're van der Waals forces, and they're, they're, really, you know, they're not really bonded to each other. And they can actually slide quite easily. So if you have a, a plastic grocery bag, for example, you can tear it apart quite easily. Uh, and for the most part, you aren't really breaking those carbon bonds. You're more like just sort of separating the molecules from each other. Um, but if you instead kind of pull it in such a way that it stretches linearly and becomes kind of more like a fiber, there's a very specific point. As you're stretching, it deforms and it stretches and then it stops. And it becomes much stronger and it starts, it's like it cuts in your finger and you can't tear it. And you realize you have to kind of pull it apart and tear it the other way because it's too strong. That's the point at which the polyethylene molecules have kind of lined up with each other and are now, you know, kind of interlocking in much the way that the fibers in a cotton thread interlock. And the strength that you're feeling is the strength of the carbon-carbon bond that goes down the backbone of those molecules. Um, it's actually quite unusual to be able to kind of directly feel uh, forces like that. And it happens because the molecules are lined up with each other. And if you take um, you know, longer polyethylene chains, this is ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene. It's maybe 500,000 carbon units long versus just a few thousand in a grocery bag. And you stretch that into fibers, you end up with a, a fiber called Dyneema, which is ordinary polyethylene, but it's among the strongest known fibers. It's stronger than Kevlar, for example. Um, uh, speaking of which, so Kevlar is, uh, uh, Kevlar is strong not because the, lo the, lo the, the chains are very long, but because they're actually kind of sticky in the same way that cotton fibers are rough on the surface and therefore kind of stick to each other. Um, these uh, benzene rings down the back of a, a Kevlar polymer, they kind of tend to you know, stick a little stronger. Um, you can go one step further, uh, which is to actually glue the metaphorical fibers to each other. So this is cross-linked um, latex rubber, what, vulcanized rubber as it's known. You take uh, this, this natural rubber and you treat it with sulfur and heat, and you build sulfur bridges between the, uh, between the polymer molecules. And when you do that, you're essentially turning them into one molecule. So I have a page in my book called A Shoe-Shaped Molecule because I did my due diligence. I did some back-of-the-envelope calculations. I talked to a couple of polymer chemists, and we kind of agreed that chances are, like you could make a defensible argument that in a vulcanized rubber shoe like that, there's at least one sulfur link from every, um, every molecule to every other one. And therefore, the whole thing is one molecule that's shaped like a shoe. And, and I thought that was kind of funny, so I called the page the shoe-shaped molecule. And then I gave a talk about three weeks ago to a group of chemical engineers in Seattle. And I asked them, well, you're chemical engineers, what do you think? Is it one molecule? And this guy raised his hand and said, well, I used to work for Nike, and uh, we studied vulcanized rubber shoe soles, and particularly investigated the question of how much of it is formed into one molecule versus how much is still solubilized. And he said, no. Um, it's probably only about 80% one molecule, and about 20% of it uh, is not connected to that. And it's like, Jesus, what are the chances that you have a you know, chemical engineer who specifically studied the question of <laughs> vulcanized rubber shoe soles and calls you out on that? Um, and I haven't quite decided yet exactly how I'm going to fix that page, but it's, it's going to have to be fixed somehow. Um, anyway, back to the cellulose. So this is the, the cellulose polymer, and like all simple polymers, it's just it's repeating unit over and over again. Uh, and as some of you may know, the repeating unit in cellulose is glucose, sugar. Um, and the only reason it doesn't taste sweet is because we don't have any kind of chemical process in our stomach that's able to break the bonds between the glucose units. They're connected in a way that you know we we don't break up. And so if you eat grass, it doesn't work. 
Um, and if you want to extract the sugar energy, the chemical energy in the sugars from cellulose, you need a different, a different chemical process, which is called cattle ranching, where you feed it to cows, and then you eat the cows, or the, the milk, or whatever. Um, uh, the energy is there. You just have to get it out appropriately. So this is two, this is two forms of sugar. The one on the left is 100% glucose. The one on the right is 50% glucose, um, because the one on the left is cotton, and the one on the right is cotton candy which is made of sucrose, which is glucose plus fructose as a disaccharide. Um, I just put that in there because it's funny. Uh, so, so cellulose is something which is made of pure sugar but isn't sweet. Um, there's other things which are made of, uh, which are sweet but not made of sugar. So saccharin's been around long enough that there are antique saccharin artifacts. This is a saccharin bowl on top of a sugar bowl. You notice the saccharin bowl is much smaller because you don't need very much saccharin because it's much more intensely sweet. Um, than sugar, and they would be these little tiny pellets, little tiny tweezers that people would use to take out little bits of saccharin and put them in their coffee. Um, but there's things that are much, much sweeter uh, than saccharin. So this is 100 pounds of sugar that I got, um, surprisingly inexpensive. So it's 170,000 calories, 14,000 times your daily carb requirements, uh, or 14,000 percent of your daily carb requirements. Um, and balanced on top, you can see a tiny little Petri dish, which we'll zoom in on. Um, that's four and a half grams of neotame, which is the sweetest uh, FDA-approved artificial sweetener. Um, it's about 300 times sweeter than Nutraceet, which it's, it's chemically derived from. It's basically Nutris meat plus a little side chain on it. 10,000 times sweeter than sugar, depending on exactly what you mean by that. Um, but anyway, so that four and a half grams is roughly equivalent in sweetness to the sugar. And this stuff, I highly recommend it. You can get like 10 grams on eBay for about 70 bucks, uh, which is worth it, because it's all the sweetness you'll ever need. Uh, and if you ever wonder about um, uh, sort of how chemical contamination or particularly radioactive contamination can, ma can happen where the quantities are similarly small, I got this packet. Uh, it's like a foil packet, 10 grams. I opened it up to measure out the four and a half grams that I calculated I needed, and within seconds of carefully and gently opening the packet, I was tasting sweet in the back of my throat. And you know, I didn't like puff it or you know, stir it up or whatever. I just slowly opened the packet, and some completely invisible tiny quantity of this fine powder had wafted up, and I was tasting it. And the next morning, after taking a shower, I could lick my, my beard and taste sweet on it from, you know, this stuff is unbelievably intensely sweet, and it gets on everything immediately because it's a very fine powder. Um, and so, you know, it's like, you can be a little bit worried about chemicals like that getting out, you know? I mean, it's like I'm tasting it, this chemical that I was just handling. And, uh, and particularly, people worry about artificial sweeteners, like should you be eating aspartame, for example, um, which I do in very large quantities because I drink nothing but Diet Coke. Um, and so I did a little calculation, like what, you know, what level of exposure are you getting? Say you were to take um, a, an appropriate amount of neotame and sweeten a cup of coffee with it, you know, the equivalent sweetness that you would typically use. Um, and, and what if it were as toxic as the most toxic known synthetic compound, which is VX nerve agent? Um, and it turns out you would actually be several times below the LD50 of VX nerve agent in the quantity of neotame that you used. So you'd probably survive. You know, you'd have a pretty, pretty high probability, actually, of surviving, even if it were you know, as poisonous as the most poisonous known substance, or, or most poisonous known synthetic substance. And that kind of colors my attitude about a number of chemicals when you think about just how little it is that you actually are, are using, especially with artificial sweeteners, which are very high intensity things. Um, and, and there's also always the question of you know, natural versus synthetic. So two of these are synthetic. Um, two of them are natural. You can tell the difference, by the way, that natural chemicals very often are hugely more complicated. Uh, like the, to synthesize stevia or migracide, that would be you know, a hugely complicated synthesis nobody would try. So you know, we tend to make much simpler, smaller molecules. Um, uh, like for example, saccharin. So here's a fact you may not know about sweet and low. Uh, saccharin is so sweet that the amount of saccharin that you need to put in a cup of coffee is sort of impractically small. Like it'd be a few grains of salt amount. And so the packet is actually mostly filler. It's about 6% saccharin and 94% filler. You want to guess what the filler is? Glucose. Dextrose. Dextrose. 
what, nutritive dextrose is what it's listed as, but that's an exact synonym for glucose. So basically, and you notice how it says zero calorie on it. Um, you may wonder, how does it say zero calorie on it if it's basically pure sugar? Um, and the answer is because there's an FDA regulation that says you can round calories to the nearest five calories. If it's less than five, you can round down. So it's one gram of glucose, there's four calories in one gram of glucose. So, um, you know, so this is a situation, so I'm sort of slightly diabetic, you know, borderline. Uh, I, I shouldn't be eating sugar. And I think it's just absolutely outrageous that this natural chemical is allowed to contaminate the pure, clean synthetic that I was looking for. Uh, you know, I want saccharin. I don't want sugar. Sugar is bad for me. Sugar is unhealthy. Uh, the tiny little bit of saccharin that's in there, that's great. They've even figured out, like, even California no longer has the saccharin warning on it that, that many of you may remember. And the reason is because they actually figured out not only that it doesn't actually cause cancer, but why it was mistakenly thought to cause cancer. Like, the mechanism by which that mistake was made was, was thoroughly understood, uh, so much so that even California took it off that the, you know, famous list of chemicals known to California. Uh, but it's still kind of that, that unbanning of saccharin is still rippling throughout the world. So this is a seemingly identical packet of sweet and low, but this one's from Canada. And if you look carefully, it's sweetened with cyclamate, because saccharin is still banned in Canada. Cyclamate is still banned in the US for the same sort of residual reason. And so we have mutually illegal sweet and lows between the US and Canada. Um, they're both almost pure sugar. but um, And in Europe, by the way, which is usually much stricter about this, both saccharin and cyclamate are legal now. And almost all these sorts of sweeteners are a mixture of the two because they taste better together. And you know we'll get there. Um, uh, oh, that way, there's, there's the Canadian sweet and low. I was using the wrong slide. Um, uh, you can tell it's Canadian because of the French. Uh, and if you look on the back, you, can, you should be able to read the cyclamate ingredient there somewhere, sodium cyclamate. Anyway, so at this point, lest I sound like a shill for the chemical industry, I want to show you a synthetic chemical I don't think should be used as an artificial sweetener. Um, so uh, the, the, this was most recently used on a large scale as an artificial sweetener by the Romans, uh, who knew it under its alchemical name of sugar of lead. Um, the modern name is lead acetate. And it's no longer used as a sweetener because it's lead. And it's, you know, it's, there's like, there is no quantity of lead that is, that is known not to be dangerous. It's like there's no lower safety limit known for lead. It's really bad. You shouldn't be eating it. Um, what's real, most surprising, actually, is that, that this brand and, and a couple other brands of progressive hair dyes for men use lead acetate as their pigment. And when your hair is being darkened by this stuff, it's the accumulation of lead in your hair that's causing that darkening. And the fact that that's legal is bizarre. And you know, it's, sort of a, it's an antique regulatory uh, leftover uh, banned in Europe and being phased out here, I think, because even the companies that make this stuff have realized that this is probably not a great idea. And if you read the FDA exemption for why lead acetate is allowed, it's like if you wear gloves, and if you, you know, engage in a great many elaborate safety precautions, it's hypothetically possible not to poison yourself with this stuff. <laughs> but realistically, not a good idea. And definitely not as an artificial sweetener. Um, but that's not because it's a, a synthetic chemical. It's because it contains lead, and lead is toxic. Um, so this, this is another example I like. This is black licorice, right? So black licorice, uh, which is not to be confused with red licorice, which is not licorice at all, the real stuff, is uh, the, the principal flavor component is glycerazine, which is toxic. It's quite significantly toxic um, to the point where if you add, I mean, it's like several hundred grams a day over a period of many months. You would build up a dose of glycerazine, which is, you know, which is you know, at, at a level where it's known to be toxic. It's, it's kidney toxicity, I think, primarily. Um, if it were a synthetic chemical, artificial food ingredient, there's absolutely no way it would ever have been permitted or would have been banned you know, long ago. But because it's a natural plant product, uh, it's completely unreg unregulated. There's no limitation on the amount of the stuff that can be in licorice. And there's actually companies that advertise particularly strong licorice for aficionados of licorice. And they're advertising the degree, you know, the, the high concentration of toxic lysarazine that's in there. Um, and that's fine, because it's a plant extract. And who cares? It must be good for you. Um, another one of my favorite plant extracts. Um, so this is a. I happened to have a couple of friends who'd recently been to Peru, just by coincidence, when I was working on this book. 
Um, and they brought me back these. So one of them is, is a coca leaf tea, commonly available in tourist shops. And the thing on the left is, is dried coca leaf, um, which you, know, you probably know the, the principal alkaloid component is cocaine, um, which is a natural plant product. And you know, it's, uh, it has its pluses and minuses. I mean, as a, as a topical anesthetic, it was absolutely revolutionary. Uh, it, like, it was the first dental anesthetic that really worked. And uh, it continues to be used to this day in, in, in medical practice as a topical anesthetic. Very effective. Um, of course, it also has, you know, it has um, other uses. Um, although amusingly, uh, one of the problems with being a drug addict is that you have, generally speaking, poor medical care and particularly poor dental care. So you get a lot of toothaches. And doctors won't prescribe pain medication for you because you're a drug addict, and they won't do that. Um, so it's widely known to drug addicts that cocaine, like rubbing powder cocaine on their gums, is really effective uh, as a treatment for toothache. And in fact, it's better pain management than most people get from their doctor, because the doctor is not legally allowed to prescribe cocaine um, for toothaches. And it's, it's by far the best thing you can actually have for a toothache. Um, but you know, but then, then there's the downside that, uh, so this is a video of a cooking um, cocaine hydrochloride, which is how you get it straight out of the plant, into freebase cocaine, otherwise known as crack cocaine. And I don't think we're going to watch the entire process, but it's basically baking soda and a lighter, and um, you turn this uh, thing, which you can't smoke, into something you can smoke. Uh, and so here on the left, that's a rock of crack cocaine. The thing on the right is a rock of heroin. And the reason I put this slide up with these two next to each other is because it's a very good example um, of sort of public policy debates about chemicals. You know, people have many opinions about drugs. And, you know, is crack better for you than heroin or vice versa? You know, or like of, of, sort of of all the different things that you can debate about the issues to do with drug use. The fact that the one on the left is a natural plant extract, whereas the one on the right is a synthetic chemical, never comes up. And why would it? Because it's just completely irrelevant. Like, who cares uh, when you're talking about substances like this? It makes absolutely no difference uh, which, you know, whether it's natural or synthetic. Um, and yet, very often, that is precisely the only content of the public debate about the relative merits of one chemical over another, or, or whether a certain chemical should be allowed. Um, this came up last year quite prominently in the case of azodicarbamide, which is a uh, chemical that's used in commercial bread baking, uh, or at least used to be. Um, and there, there was sort of a big you know, to-do about this. And Subway you know, announced that they were, they're going to stop using this in their dough. Um, and there's actually, you know, it, it's, when it's heated, it turns into semi-carbazide. And there's some evidence that that might be harmful. Regulators in Europe are looking at it in a sensible way to see whether it, it ought to be permitted or not. Uh, but the public debate in the US was entirely based on um, people repeating over and over again that this chemical is used to make rubber yoga mats. And would you want, you know, why should you use a chemical that's used to make rubber yoga mats in your bread? Like, this is terrible, and we should ban this. And Subway essentially backed down and said, OK, we're going to stop using it. Um, and like, you know, this is a dumb way of debating chemicals. And, and I hope it doesn't go any farther, because I happen to really like lye bread, um, you know, these, these little lye rolls. And the way you make lye bread, it fundamentally involves the use of lye, hence the name. Um, lye is not a name for sodium hydroxide. It's drain opener. Um, if you're a crack dealer and you have a problem with somebody, lye is what you use to dispose of the bodies. So you know, it's a very, very nasty chemical. Uh, you know, it's tremendously caustic. It's a drain opener. It should be, we'd be using drain opener to make bread. Yes, absolutely. There's no reason not to use drain opener to make bread, because the fact that you can use a chemical for one thing or another has nothing to do with it. Um, uh, the question is, you know, what is the chemical? Is it good for you? Is it harmful? How is it being used? What's the dose? You know, all kinds of questions that essentially didn't come up at all in the debate about azodicarbamide. Um, and the fact is that actually everybody loves chemicals, whether, no matter what they say. Uh, you know, for example, if you like asparagus, I happen to be particularly fond of asparagus. If you like asparagus, these are the chemicals that you particularly like the taste of. Uh, if you like some other food, you know, I can give you another list of the chemicals that you like the taste of. Um, many of these chemicals are insecticides. They're, you know, they're, they're pesticides, they're fungicides, they're antibacterial agents. Um, none of them are put there by us. They're put there by the plant. 
because plants have this problem that they're immobile. They, you know, they, they can't move. Their only defense is chemical warfare against being eaten by various things. And so plants are actually um, very active participants in the, the enterprise of generating toxic chemicals. Um, actually, here's some more, some more sort of random chemicals. You probably can't read it there. Uh, this happens to list the colors that are made by the plant to color themselves in this way uh, in each of these cases. Um, and so you know, plants, plants spend a lot of time making toxic chemicals. Um, uh, here, for example, these are the four most toxic known compounds. The top three are all natural products. The fourth, the VX nerve agent is number four. Um, it's, it's about 2,000 times less toxic than number one, which is botulinum. Uh, number two is metatoxin, which is made by a type of marine plankton. Number three is the poison dart frog poison. Um, you know, these are, these are all natural products. Plants are really good at that. Um, and, you know, and it's, uh, it's disconcerting, disheartening, and sort of dysfunctional to talk about chemicals so exclusively as is it artificial and therefore bad, or is it natural and therefore good? You kind of, you get it wrong in two different ways. And um, uh, so this is another project that we worked on in Touch Press, a, a book about the, uh, you know, the, the whole DNA exoneration enterprise that's now, you know, so, and it has been for some time now, you know, discovering these tremendous injustices that happened uh, decades ago, people who were locked up. Um, and, uh, you know, one lesson from that is the power of DNA. And it turns out DNA is really, really powerful, not just for, solving crimes, but for investigating many things. Uh, for example, uh, and, I, and the reason I put the reference up there is because I, every time I say this, I have trouble believing it, but go read the study. I read the whole thing. It's very thoroughly done. It's a totally legit study. What they did was they investigated um, herbal supplements. They went out uh, around the country. They bought 40 or 50 uh, different you know, national brands of herbal supplements, and they did DNA fingerprinting on the plant material that was in those supplements. And then they compared, they went to botanical greenhouses and had experts you know, identify, uh, they did, you know, made a library of DNA fingerprints of uh, herbs of known provenance. So they could very um, uh, you know, authoritatively determine what's in those supplements and what's not. And so not surprising, like 60, 65%, something like that, were found to contain plant material that was not listed on the labels. You know, nobody's perfect. That doesn't seem so shocking to me. What's more surprising is over 30% of them contain none of any of the listed ingredients at all. Um, none of any of the listed ingredients. So to represent this in my book, because um, uh, I did actually want to go out and buy an herbal supplement pill, uh, and there was no point. I just raked up some leaves in the backyard and chopped them up and put them in a pill, which is to say I did exactly the same thing as 30% of the manufacturers of these supplements. Um, and the point is that, you know, if you, if you sort of blindly believe claims of all natural, wholesome, you know, we're a small family farm, you may actually be dealing with a rapacious corporation based in New Jersey, which is ripping you off. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not really useful to apply skepticism because it's Monsanto, but not because it's this friendly company. One ought to, you know, sort of use truth and uh, uh, mechanisms for actually finding the truth to determine these things rather than... Um, what is essentially amounts to prejudice. Um, I think I'll skip this particular <coughs> example. Um, right, that's, uh, yeah. So, so I'll skip that example and go right on to the funniest thing I know about vanilla, um, which is my last little example, and then we can have little demos here. Um, so, you know, as you may know, there's two kinds of vanilla you can get in the store. There's natural vanilla and there's artificial vanilla. Uh, and it turns out these are chemically identical. It's the same vanilla and it's the same molecule. One is derived from vanilla beans and it's very expensive because uh, you, know, you have to grow the vanilla beans. They actually apparently have to be pollinated by hand in a sort of rainforest plantation and then they have to be fermented and it's quite expensive to make natural vanilla. Synthetic vanilla, I got a kilogram on eBay for like 20 bucks or something. It's, it's a trivial chemical to synthesize, dirt cheap. And uh, this of course means there's a tremendous temptation for companies to adulterate and to sell artificial vanilla under the, um, you know, calling it natural, because there's huge profit to be made, and there's no chemical test that can determine the difference. It's impossible to apply any chemical test. Um, but you can't tell the difference. And the way you do it is based on carbon-14. As you may know, 
Uh, the atmosphere is full of carbon-14, well, tiny amounts, but anyway, it's incorporated by plants into their cells when they grow, and it then very slowly decays over tens of thousands of years. Um, uh, natural vanilla is made from plants that grew quite recently. Artificial vanilla is made from petroleum feedstocks, which is also plants, uh, but it's plants that grew a very long time ago. And so the carbon-14 is completely decayed. So the way you tell is that natural vanilla is radioactive, whereas synthetic vanilla is not. Um, <laughs> And this is, how, this is actually how this is detected in the commercial trade. If the carbon-14 date of your vanilla is too old, it's fake. In other words, if it's not radioactive enough, it's fake. Um, which I just think is, I don't know, for some reason I think that's very funny. Um, <laughs> and a good example of uh, you know, the use of science to find truth. Anyway, so uh, these are, where are, we, where are we? Here we go. These are all my books, which you should all buy. Um, then I want to do two things. Um, uh, I want to show you a preview, a, a, a now it's, I guess it's a release candidate beta version, something in, there in between, uh, of the Molecules app, uh, and then I have a couple of demonstrations. Okay, yeah, so this is the, um, and like I say, unfortunately, no Android, but you know, maybe you guys can talk me into it someday. Um, the uh, iPad uh, version of Elements, um, or sorry, of Molecules, uh, so it has um, things in it. You can spin them. Uh, it has, let's see if we go to um, here. It also has, unlike in Elements, it has a larger number of what I refer to as still life video, which is kind of an, an aesthetic I've been developing. So these are little things that move when you touch them. They're not really videos, but they are video, and they kind of, they kind of exist on the page. And they're meant to sort of you know, illustrate, uh, in this case, the difference, the viscosity between uh, longer and shorter hydrocarbon chains, respectively. Um, but the thing that's really interesting in this app is something that um, uh, you really have not seen before. I'm trying to find the right place to, um, yeah, so here's a good one. Um, so when you see these diagrams of molecules, I mean, you've seen them everywhere, right? These are all lies. Molecules are not flat things like that on paper. And if you've seen 3D renderings of molecules where they're, or, or plastic you know, 3D models of molecule, those are lies too because, I mean, they're closer. Molecules are three-dimensional things, but they aren't rigid things at all. Um, this is actually uh, what molecules really look like. Um, they're, generally speaking, very flexible floppy things that are in constant motion. Uh, they're always vibrating. And so what we have in the Molecules app is this um, high-end piece of molecular dynamics simulation software that's normally you know, sort of a supercomputer thing, but we're doing it with small molecules. Um, and it's doing you know, quantum mechanics guided simulation, um, legitimate um, you know, molecular dynamic simulation of what these molecules are actually like with multi-touch interface so you can pick up, you know, separate parts of the molecule simultaneously and kind of stretch it out. Um, I actually managed to, uh, if you take, um, we go to that metatoxin, which is amazing multi-fused ring structure. Um, get it in here somewhere. Um, so yeah, if you zoom in, it's, it's just like one ring after another, all different sizes, the kind of thing that only, only biology can synthesize molecules like this. Um, and I managed to tie it in a knot. It takes about a minute or two to, to do this, but you can actually pick this thing up and um, very slowly, the simulation's a little slow, but you can actually drag this thing out and um, tie a knot in it. Um, Anyway, I think this is going to be quite interesting when people, like a large number of people, get to actually see and experience what molecules are like uh, as sort of living, moving things. Uh, but it's not out yet. It'll be out um, next week, or maybe the week after. The week after. Okay. And now we have uh, just a couple of demos. We'll leave this one for last in case. It's the last demo. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so the first one is uh, along the lines of, you know, sort of telling real from fake. So, I, you know, I don't, I don't do the kind of really spectacular science demos that people sometimes do, so I try to have like some kind of relevance to them. Um, 
And this one is practical advice on how to tell real silk from fake silk. It turns out that fake silk uh, is actually incredibly good these days. And even experts can't really reliably tell just by feeling it. Um, uh, you know whether it's real or not, because there's enough variation in what silk is, what real silk is like, uh, and and the imitations are good enough that it's you know you, you need a better way. And uh, obviously you can do chemical analysis or whatever, but there's a much simpler way, which is to simply burn a bit of it. And apparently if you're a silk buyer and you go uh, you're evaluating uh, something, that's how you do it: is you take a lighter along and you pull a little thread out of the garment and you light it. And so I read about this and I was thinking like. It sounds pretty clear, but how does it really look? And so I'll, I'll give you now a practical demonstration of how you tell what it actually looks like. And thank you, Simon, for this fine torch. Um, so you burn it, and if it's silk, you see how it kind of melts? It actually um, it pulls back a little bit, but it then it always puts itself out eventually. And th this is the point where we'll find out. And it also... Um, uh, it leaves the char behind. There's like a black char, and it smells of burning hair. It's a terrible smell. Um, synthetic. So this is, um, I believe this is nylon. It feels really nice. It's a beautiful rope. Um, and when you burn this, and this is, will be true of any synthetic um, you know, imitation silk, you get, first of all, it melts much more. And when it does eventually catch fire, um, yeah, that is absolutely diagnostic of fake silk. When you have the, the dripping, flaming balls of death falling down, um, uh, that's not silk. But it's also much more attractive, really, in a darkened room. That's, that's kind of fun. Um, oh, oh, right, and you can hear. I don't know if you can hear that. Let me see. Anyway, this is really a fun demo to do when the kids are not there, because they learn. Um, OK, now we can hopefully get this to go out. Spray some hairspray on it. Yeah, that would probably work. Um, OK, so, this, so there's a whole section in, in the book, and in particular on the app, it's good. There's a whole section of lots of different fibers burning. And they're quite, it's quite attractive, different, you know, the, the ways in which different types of fibers burn. Some of them burn you know, very differently. Cotton balls burn in a very beautiful way. Um, Kevlar doesn't burn at all. Uh, and then, of course, there's the whole natural versus synthetic. Um, but one of the more surprising things that burns uh, is actually steel wool. You might not think of steel or iron as flammable. And normally it isn't, but only because normally when you have some of it, it's like a big chunk of it with a substantial volume versus surface area. But if you have fine steel wool like this, uh, it has very little volume and a lot of surface area. And it turns out it's actually, and we should at this point turn off the lights if that's possible. Does anybody know how to turn off the, oh, there's a bunch of light switches over here. Uh, can you? Over there. There we go, perfect, okay. Oh, great. Um, yeah, so it turns out that steel wool actually burns very nicely. And it's quite attractive when, it's, when, it, when it works right. And just kind of light it here. And then you get this lovely kind of little worms of, of fire coming up. And you notice that it's, uh, it's different from uh, most kinds of fire that you see because the fire is happening right on the surface of the metal. Normally when you have wood burning or something like that, the fire is above the wood. And that's because what's actually happening is that the, the, the wood is volatilizing and there's flammable gases that are going. It's the gas above that's really doing most of the burning. But here nothing volatilizes and there's no smoke other than a tiny bit from oil, you know, residual oil on the steel wool. Because what's happening is the iron is being converted in place into iron oxide. And it's actually what's happening, this is rusting. This is just high speed rust. Um, and rusting is a very exothermic process and when it happens fast enough, um, you know, things get hot and we call it fire. Uh, but really it's just rusting. And it kind of puts itself out because there's not much left to do. Um, so one of the, um, we'll just let that burn out. You could turn the, I guess you could leave them off, I don't know. Um, so one of the chapters in the book uh, is called I Hate That Molecule. Um, which I hate, I hate that title. 
I think that's a really stupid title for the chapter, but they wouldn't let me call it. What I really wanted to call it is Molecules That Piss People Off, but they wouldn't let me do that because <laughs> children and all. Um, and uh, so it's, that's a chapter about molecules which just kind of cause people to be angry about something or other and cause there to be hate in the world. And like the number one molecule there is thimerosal because of the whole uh, anti-vaccination um, um, deal, which, you know, whatever side of that you're on, and I hope you're on the pro-vaccination side, but either way, people get really angry. People call each other murderers and, and you know, whatever. Um, another, another class of compounds is on there is chlorofluorocarbons. So that, that debate is kind of over now. And actually, I was just reading just after the book went to press that for the first time, like the ozone hole is getting better again now. It's like there's actually been some progress in atmospheric uh, science. Um, but there was a time when there was tremendous uh, discord about that and people, you know, calling each other names. Um, um, and one of the, the arguments that was made is that chlorofluorocarbons, particularly in aerosol cans, are really good because they're not flammable. And the alternatives uh, are, generally speaking, pretty flammable. Uh, and that argument eventually was won over in the survival of the species side of the camp. Um, and so now we have aerosol cans that are much more exciting than they used to be um, because their propellants are now uh, more flammable. And so I brought you three examples of that, um, two hairsprays. And this, I don't get to do this demo when there's children present because I, even I draw the line at teaching kids how to make flamethrowers uh, with their mom's hairspray. Um, well, it depends. So that's why I get different brands. Um, we can see what it is in this one. Um, let's see. Uh, 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 this is SD alcohol, which is not a propellant, and hydrofluorocarbon 152A. Usually there's a, where is it? Now that, so that one is, um, usually there's, a, there's an ether in there. Didn't actually read these ingredients before. Um, amino methyl propanol could be the propellant. Where is it? Anyway, um, yeah, it's usually, there's like a methyl ethyl, um, is it methyl ethyl ketone? What is it? I forget. I don't know. There's various things. It's like they try to make it as non-flammable as they can, but without a chlorofluorocarbon, you're kind of limited. Um, so we were going to aim that away. Um, so th this one's actually fairly tame, I think. I forget which one it is. Um, so if you've ever seen the James Bond movie, it actually does work. Um, uh, and then this one is a slightly different combination. Um, you can kind of tell how, um, how volatile some of the components are by how far back the flame reaches towards the can. Um, you, want to, you want to go with brands where it doesn't reach the nozzle. Um, well, okay. So, actually the valves in these aerosol cans are deep inside the metal, and so there's, there's not actually that much opportunity for the entire can to explode. So, it turns out that if you really want it, if you, if you want this actually to work really well, you need to pick something which not only has a flammable propellant, but which is actually intended to be flammable, um, namely starter fluid. Uh, <laughs> this works really well. Uh, So uh, we're trying to, I guess you got a router up there or something. Um, and we want to stay away from the, uh, the sprinkler system. Uh, it's uh, highly recommended as a home um, demonstration of something. Um, yeah, so now we find out how good the fire detection system in here is. I don't know if you could feel the heat, but it's actually surprisingly hot. Um, so, okay, well, there you go. Thank you very much. That's my demonstration. So, um, I work on Chrome, and I'm a little bit biased on, on, you know, people building native apps versus, you know, for iOS or Android or something versus the web. And obviously, you got started a few years ago when the web couldn't do as many things as it can do now. I was wondering if you could talk 
nerdily a little bit about why you just have an iOS app versus an Android app and whether or not you've looked at being able to do some of this stuff on the web because your apps yeah, so are amazing. That's, that's a good question. And I mean, so the, the Elements app is actually, and, and the Molecules app, with the exception of the molecular dynamics simulation, is, you know, you could do that as an HTML5 thing. I mean, the, being able to spin, you know, I think, you know, five years ago when we did it, it, it was probably not really going to be super smooth as a web thing. It probably could be done as a web thing. But many of the apps that we do are, you know, they have a lot more, like, stuff that you can't really do as a web app sort of a thing. You know, I don't know how you exactly describe it, but it's like you need your fingers on the hardware a little more. Uh, you need performance. You need access to, um, you know, bits of the hardware uh, that you can't necessarily get to through, through a web interface. And, I mean, we, you know, we... You know, we're in the business of publishing apps to make money on the sales of the apps, which is a really tough business to be in. I think it's gotten worse and worse over time. Um, you know, so, so the Elements app just, uh, you know, we, we sold, I think, um, 360,000 copies, something like that, at $14 a copy. And that's very unusual for apps. It's like apps don't cost $14, and if they do, they don't sell in those sort of numbers. Um, and you know that's and we've we've had you know that's our best selling app to date. It's our first app. It's the one that kind of got this company started. We've had a few other apps that have been successful at those at those price points. You know, Disney Animated has been you know done reasonably well at ten dollars a copy. Um, we make these kind of super premium, lush. You know, they're like the the app equivalent of a coffee table book, and it's very difficult to get people to consider the concept of paying actual money let alone like $10 for an app. The exact same people who you know, would not bat an eye at paying $20 or $30 for a print book, or even $10 for an iBook. Uh, not an iBook, I mean an eBook, just like a regular eBook on their Kindle with no pictures or anything, just plain text. People are more willing to spend $10 on a plain text eBook than they are on the same text in an app. Uh, there was a great example of that, some book, not one of ours, but a book that came out simultaneously in print uh, as a, a static ebook, as an audio book, and as an app. The app, of course, included you know, everything that all the other versions had, the full text and the, and the, the recording, and, and, and plus lots of other interactivity. And of course, the app was by far the cheapest. The audio book was the most expensive, um, and the ebook was you know, in between. Um, uh, and that makes no sense. It's entirely sort of you know, the psychological. Uh, environment of the App Store. And that's unfortunately a place where the Android App Store is, is like it's even worse than the, I, the iOS App Store. The iOS App Store started out, and particularly for iPad apps, you know, supporting a reasonably high price point for people who wanted to make money you know, by actually selling the apps, as opposed to you know, many people who make apps who have completely different ways of making money or who are just going for the viral hit and you know, can, can make buy you know, with a few cents a user or something. Um, uh, and every time we try to think about doing this for Android, and it's not that we have anything you know, against Android, it's just like we have X amount of money to put into developing our next app. And if we do this for iOS, we kind of, you know, we kind of have some expectation of what we're going to make back. We have one platform to target. You know, well, all right, two or three, whatever, but they're very nicely integrated. They all, you know, it works. We look at Android, it's like, first of all, forget all the phones, because people don't use this on phones. So you're talking about tablets only. Um, the is fragmentation, uh, it's maintenance, the development costs are much higher, and the store is not one that is conducive to high-priced apps. And so we always just say, no, you know what, let's make another iOS app. Um, and I wish it weren't so. And I wish we could do something that would be, you know, that would be cross-platform as a web thing. But you know, when you're doing synchronized audio, uh, you know, complex interactivity with, with multiple streams of audio and, and things and, and, and video, and you know, our apps are very big. They're like a gigabyte or more sometimes. Um, it's, it's like there's only one platform where that really makes sense, and it's unfortunately right now um, iOS. And uh, you know, I think it's it's like the days are numbered where we're we're going to keep doing this because the returns are actually are not improving, despite the number of devices because the app store environment is deteriorating. Um, what inspired you to get into chemistry and stay in chemistry? Well, actually, I was never really in chemistry. So I, I have a bachelor's degree in chemistry, um, and then I dropped out of graduate school to 
uh, go and, and co-found Wolfram Research with Stephen Wolfram, um, which is makers of Mathematica and ultimately Wolfram Alpha. Um, and so I spent you know, the last, I mean, that was 1987. Uh, and up until a couple years ago, that was kind of my job. Uh, and this whole you know, periodic table book writing stuff is just a hobby. Um, since then, I've now kind of transitioned into you know, touch press or map company being my primary occupation. And since then, decided, OK, no, I'm just going to be a writer uh, and, and do this, because this is much more interesting than, uh, than working on other people's projects. Um, but you know, as far as why chemistry, I don't know. I, don't, you know, I, want, I, I like the names. You know, I think organic chemical naming systems are fascinating. That was my original reason for studying organic chemistry. Um, not, a, not a good basis for a career choice. And then the reason I decided to get out of chemistry was because I realized that if I became a professional chemist, particularly an academic chemist, I wouldn't get to do any chemistry. Like, you know, I like blowing stuff up and mixing things. And you, know, and you can't do that if you're a chemist because you spend all your time writing grant proposals. And you know, being, a, being a science writer, like for Popular Science column, every month for 10 years, I got to blow something up. You know, they'd send a photographer down. I had a big shop. And you know, we would do something involving chemicals and you know, build transparent rocket engines and all this stuff that you don't get to do if you're actually a chemist. So my interest was primarily um, nurtured and, and, and expanded by not actually being a chemist in a professional sense, but getting to kind of do all the stuff that is the most fun and the most useful in terms of you know, communicating chemistry to the public. I actually got an award from the American Chemical Society called the Grady Stack Award for Communication of Chemistry to the Public, um, which I, I think of as the We Found a Journalist Who Doesn't Hate Us Award, um, <laughs> which, is, which is hard. Um, it's hard for them. They don't have a lot of choice, as evidenced by the fact that they gave it to me. With all the content that you have, have you ever considered creating a MOOC to open chemistry to the masses? Funny you should ask. Yes, I have thought about it. And I've also thought about how much I enjoy not being a, a creator of stuff that actually gets officially used in schools. right? Because as soon as you do that, um, you're, there's so many restrictions. And there's so much you can't do. Like my books will find themselves in the library of a grade school if, it's, if no parent has noticed. Um, and, you know, and, and it's like the more enlightened parents get it for their kids but it would never, ever pass as a textbook. And I wouldn't want to have to take everything out of it. Actually, in the case of the Molecules book, I admit, OK, okay we, we sold so many copies of Elements to the scholastic book fairs, where they go around to schools and they have these displays, like, like lots of copies every year. And so you know, my publisher was very eager that they should do the same thing with Molecules. And so they ran it by them. And there was this, this, this woman who reminds me of Dolores Umbridge. Um, uh, from the Harry Potter series, uh, who went through it line by line. And we cut out, you know, there was some stuff that even I have to admit after the fact was perhaps a bit off color and maybe not really belonging there. And there was a marijuana bud that was full page. It was gorgeous. I mean, it was just, it was unbelievably beautiful. And you can talk about the fact that that's a pesticide to the plant. You know, it's, the THC is a pesticide that the plant makes. Um, uh, but we took it out because it's just like, you don't really need that. And we made the heroin rock smaller because it, it, it was gorgeous too. It's a beautiful, beautiful rock of heroin that I had to flush down the toilet because you really can't hang on to that kind of thing. Um, um, but, you know, uh, where was I going with this? I don't know. Yeah, so right, actually being a textbook author isn't very appealing because you don't get to do that kind of stuff. However, there's value in it. And you know, watch this space, perhaps. Okay, let's all thank Teo for coming here and giving a super fun talk. <laughs> <laughs>